welcome, Henry. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Karen. Oh, it's so I'm so thrilled to have you on the podcast because, as I mentioned in the in the intro, uh, there's a lot of people getting off the bench, you know, for their own gain. You know, to what what can I do to make myself happy? And what I love it when people get off the bench to serve others, and I. Totally believe if we serve others first, we feel great about ourselves, and then we, yes. you know, we we do amazing stuff. So, you 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 looking after your students and recognizing this need is just it's it's um I don't know I think it's just the most humbling sort of it's it's beautiful that people go out of their way to do that. But what about your upbringing? Were you were you raised to serve others? Like you know what what sort of things were you taught when you were younger? Well, yes, ma'am, very much so. Um, well, to start off with, uh, my father died uh, when I was three years old. My mm -hmm. grandmother died when I was seven, and um, mm -hmm. my mother died when I was 17. Oh. Um, but as a very young boy, my mother used to take me around to something called Old Folk Home. And at a very early age, she taught me how to braid and how to plait. And at the Old Folk Home, um, I had to wash their feet, I had to brush their teeth. And I'm talking with a five or six year old kid. Uh, braid their hair, um, and as I got older, I had to cut wood for them. So I grew up learning how to serve others. Uh, it was something that I emulated uh, from my mother and her sister, uh, who were missionaries. And also, I was um, old enough also to learn that from my grandmother. So that's the uh, the genesis of trying to help others. Wow. So, so they would have been very disappointed if you didn't help others. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, very much so. Because even then, uh, when, when, when I used to do for others, I was not allowed to charge them for anything. You just have to do that. You're not going to charge him or her anything. So uh, I just grew up trying to help people. And I also saw my mother and my sister and grandmother helping others. So it's just a part um, of my home culture. Oh, that's and it was that part of the reason you became a, a principal or a teacher. I presume you were a teacher first and then became a principal. Well, my becoming a teacher was basically um, my mother's um, idea because because of the times um, in, in, in the American South where my mother was born, um, she could not go beyond the seventh grade. I mean, that was the law at that time. And my father, who was born in Williamsburg County, he cannot go beyond the second grade. And my mother, who was all, my grandmother, who was also born in Berkeley County, she wasn't educated at all. But my mother always wanted uh, to become a teacher. And since she cannot become a teacher in her time, uh, she structured that reality into my life. And I grew up uh, on my mother's lap saying that I, I'm hearing her say, you are going to be a teacher. You're going to be a teacher. So. <laughs> Year after year after year after hearing that, um, I decided that I did want to become a teacher. <laughs> That's fantastic. And if your mother wasn't saying that, is there another reality you would have created for yourself? Yes, um, I would have gone into the military uh, as a young man. I knew that I needed discipline, but uh, Vietnam was going on. And uh, my mother you know, kept telling me, you are my only child. You're my only son. And um, I loved my mother so that I did respect her wishes and uh, did not go into the military. I went on to college. Uh, but the sad thing is um, the, the one year after I went to college, uh, my mother died and she never saw my going into the classroom. But her, oh. her reality, I mean, her vision of my becoming a teacher came true. Yeah. Oh, I had that. what a shame. But at yes. least you're leaving, what, what a legacy, you know, what a legacy your mother's left and what a legacy you. you're leaving for other people too. It's, oh, it's very admirable. I think, I think she did the right thing. We, oh, we, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> we're, we're, <laughs> we, we're doing better with you on this earth than, than, than <laughs> being shot in Vietnam. So. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, you made me laugh. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, uh, bet the, I bet the students are pretty pleased too. <laughs> oh, oh yes ma'am uh, you know at first um you know walmart was too good for them they wouldn't work at a walmart but when they saw that their principal work a number of my students uh went out to apply for walmart and uh, they got the job so um it's all about helping others and uh it, it was just uh i, I don't see anything fa fantastic um of my doing so i simply went to get a job to get some money to help people i 
I don't find anything so fantastic about that. I, I really don't, but um, <laughs> they say so. So I, I guess I'll just have to go along with it. Yeah, but all, tr all true heroes never see the greatness of what they've done. <laughs> so, ah, <but> okay. <laughs> when did you, when did you, um, so, so you will we'll have seen some of your students struggling and come to that realization that, oh, this is just beyond what I can manage. You know, I can't cope with this and it's so sad. Uh, what, what sort of, um, was there an initial feeling of helplessness? Did, like, did you start off thinking, I can't do anything about this? Or did you just well, know it straight away? Well, growing up, um, you know, I taught economics uh, at one of the high schools where I uh, taught. And um, I always taught my students about the three Esters. Uh, you save, uh, you spend and you share. So I was at a point in my life where I was able to share with my students and my students' parents when they were in need of their lease being paid or food need being a home or mortgage need paid. And if the word got out, well, you know, you go to Mr. Dobb, he'll help you. <laughs> but it got to the point that um, it just wasn't enough. And I began going into my emergency funds and my emergency funds um, is for my children and grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So when I started dipping into my emergency funds, something said, you, you still have to help people. And at the same time, you want to save for your children and grandchildren, it's time for you to get another job. And that's when it was decided. Um, Walmart was close and is pro close proximity to my home. And uh, my home was in close proximity to my work. So um, I went to Walmart and um, they gave me a position. <laughs> wow. So stacking shelves from 7 p.m. to 10 a.m. Uh, 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. Correct. When did you get any sleep? <laughs> um, I basically rest on the weekends. Um, I would sleep all day Saturdays and all day Sundays. Uh, for the first month or so, I was working five days a week. And it got a little too much because I'm getting up in age now and there was some aches and pains. And I asked Walmart, could you mind reducing to four? And uh, of course, and that was a little bit too much. So I said, let me ask just one more time. So um, they allowed me to work three days a week so I could manage that much more effectively than four or five days. And uh, that was Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So on Saturday and Sundays, I just slept all day. I would go in at 10 o'clock and at seven o'clock, I'm punching up because I have to be to work between 7.30 and 7.45. Wow. So effectively, it wasn't just that you gave up your nights and you gave up the money, you also gave up your weekends, which are quite yes. valuable. You know, like when, when you're, yes. as you're getting older, you know, it's your weekends that you, you sort of work all your life so that you can have that, you, you know, yes. enjoyable things. So, you know, you've even given up um, the, the relaxation part of your life, you know, to, to help your students. Do you think they, how, what sort of gratitude have they shown to you? for? Oh my goodness. Um, there have been uh, many thanks and we appreciate it. Um, we appreciate you doing this for us, Mr. Darby. But the fact of the matter is uh, the, the actual greatness came when donors and contributors throughout the United States and folk from you know, Australia, Germany, uh, um, Africa, uh, and, and folks start sending donations to my school, North Charleston High, and I'm saying what a wonderful thing because I wasn't going to have it publicized, not even the local press, but my executive director said, perhaps you need to do this. You need to do this. And I said, no, no. And when he <laughs> asked, uh, Mr. Trevor Strudman, when he asked the second time, it was, in, it was more like asking, it was almost like, you know, I'm going to advise you, please consider letting the story be told. And because of that, um, along with Walmart, the dollars came in. So folk are very, appreciative and I've had um, one young lady out of Texas which is a great deal from South Carolina she has given my school a food pantry and a laundromat wow I just the idea of people giving because they saw a principal trying to help the students and their parents that is amazing yeah I saw you I don't know where I saw you might have been on Facebook or something like that but it was on the ABC uh, eyewitness news story and yes ma'am 
Ah, oh, it was it was fantastic. And there's not enough of those feel good stories. I'm so glad you shared because we see so much tragedy, you know, so many, uh, you know, arguments and so much murder and just horrible stuff. Yes all the time and when you get these little good news stories in your feed it really lights you up and I remember seeing it and I said oh I've got to email Henry Darby (laughs) (laughs) yes ma'am well thank you so very much (laughs) oh my I think we need to share, we, sh- we need to share these stories and we need to, I think the other thing is too, that we need to inspire people who maybe think that they can't do anything about it. You know, we need mm-hmm. to inspire them to realize that there are, there are things I can do about it, you know, and it's not always, yes. it's not always the big heroic things, you know, that, that garner awards and that sort of stuff. It, it can be, you know, simply just getting that part-time job. There's a lot of people that, in fact, I think most people I know, most people around the world would would not give up their paycheck to oh. um, help others, you know, because they'd be thinking, oh, I'm getting all this extra money. I was going to help people with it, but now I can actually help myself and have a whole... Oh, yes, ma'am. And Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Well, um, that may have gone through my mind, but um, it was a uh, promise that I made um, that I was going to help my students with those dollars. And, um, and, and, and prior to that, you know, I was just coming directly out of the pocket, but I needed to do more. So, but yes, ma'am, every dime that I got uh, went to my students and their parents. So, um, but the, in the final analysis, it went for a cause because when you have students, um, I had two female students sleeping under a bridge, um, I had one of my former students and her child, who was, which was a student of mine, you know, sleeping in their cars or, when you have a problem at home with one of your students and the parents ask you to come over and you see the living conditions, um, I think any other principal would have done the same if they were in my position. I don't think this is a vacuum with just, you know, a Henry Darby would do this alone. I think there would be many others who would do the same had they seen the conditions and were able to, um, to assist. I'm quite sure others would have helped now. Yeah. Was there any time where you thought, oh, why am I doing this? Like, I, I can't keep up. I'm so exhausted. I'm going to have to stop. Like, we did that go through your mind? Well, I reckon it well, would have done most weeks. <laughs> well, uh, well, a couple of times on one occasion, because at one time, I mean, I used to boast that I was the fastest worker um, at Walmart with stock on the shelves, which I was. And um, there was one night I had this big cart. I mean, this huge cart over so I, over 2,000 pounds of um, chemicals I had to put up. So I was moving not as well as I should have, and I got written up. And, I, and I'm saying, this is the first offense. I didn't get a warning or anything, and you're going to write me up? And I said to myself, not to my supervisor, I said, I don't need this. But <laughs> when, I, why, when I realized you know, why I was there, it was for Henry Darby, it was for my students. And um, a couple of times, they would send me to the freezer and it was exceptionally cold. I mean, cold. Do I really need this with arthritis? I said, I don't need this. But again, there was a greater need. But um, I thought about it, but never uh, did I contemplate seriously leaving Walmart. Yeah, it's massive, isn't it? I, you know, I work with a lot of people and I talk about you have to know your why. Yeah, you, you know, because... Yes. There's whenever you're doing a, a project or a, or a startup or you know or whenever you're doing something like what you're doing, it's all very exciting at first, and then there's a big dip, you you know, and yes. that that dip is really challenging. It's really hard. It hurts us, you know. There's a lot of discomfort in there, and a lot of people give up in that dip, you know. And mm-hmm. but I always say to people, if you know your why, you have to be sure about your why, you know, because yes. that's the thing that when it's hard, that's the thing that keeps, pulls you back up again, you know, and just keeps driving you along. Yes, ma'am. True enough. True enough. Yeah. So I mean, my why was there um, simply um, to help others. And, um, and until this, um, I had to have this operation because when my surgeon, because the surgeon had a neck, he said, I could not lift my head up to stock shelves. He said, you can't do it any longer. I said, well, doctor, I mean, could we compromise on this? He said, absolutely not, because there are some bones implanted within my neck. He said, you just couldn't do it anymore. 
And I actually, you know, I shared some tears uh, when I had to leave Walmart after seven months because I wanted to continue because Walmart for me has such a great health plan. And here's the health plan. You go to work at 10, you get off at seven and you don't eat anything because had you been sleeping, you would not have been eating. And I went to Walmart wearing, wearing 260 pounds and when I left, I was wearing 220 pounds. So it was wow. a great health plan. So <laughs> I missed that health plan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's <Yeah>. fantastic. <laughs> well, maybe we all need to get a job at Walmart. I'm, I'm putting on a few pounds too. <laughs> yes, I, I just didn't eat as, as you know, as the other, um, my co workers would have lunch the early morning, three or four o'clock. I didn't, I would drink water and was burning all those calories night after night. I, I mean, the weight just went down. It, I was, and I felt so good about myself. Mm. I really felt good. I'm now, I'm lighter, trimmer. Um, my <laughs> knees aren't hurting anymore. And oh. um, it was just a beautiful, this, uh, I call it my health plan, Walmart's health plan. <laughs> I absolutely love it. I love it. So you're not working there anymore. That's that's quite sad. But um, the community has, you, you know, given so much to your school. So yes. Do you think that yes. with the, um, so you instigated it and then the communities helped it along and Walmart also gave 50,000 to, you know, to your school. Yes, ma'am. Are yes, you now, in, is your school now in a position um, to support all of these students? Uh, Karen, let me tell you, ma'am, the outpouring that this nation and people from around the world gave, my students are doing exceedingly well with the donation and contributions, ma'am. Um, no one has gone lacking of paying uh, in terms of the light bill or water bill or paying mortgage. Uh, in the past, uh, when this was a single thing by Henry Darby, uh, I think on two or three occasions, I was taken advantage of. Mm. But now that there's an entire booster club where we have 10 or more people, um, there's set of guidelines where people won't be able to take advantage and people are actually being helped um, food is uh, ever ready here, and it's just amazing uh, that the funds and and because we had one donor who simply came in and gave my students um, ten five thousand dollars scholarships. I, I, it's just amazing, and uh, we have a good number of volunteers, but a good number of companies. I, I just can't I can't elucidate in terms of what they have done for North Charleston High School. Wow, that is fantastic. When did you, when, you know, the two that were sleeping under the bridge, yes. when, how did you become aware of them sleeping under there? I almost, and I get emotional now, I just even think about it. Um, every morning I am in front of my school, you know, ushering the kids to class. Let's go, let's go. And these girls were late and late and late. And I really jumped on, I said, I'm tired of y'all coming to my school. I'm tired, I'm tired. And someone informed me, Mr. Darby, they don't have a house, they're sleeping under a bridge. And I said, what? Are you kidding me? And right then, because I, I tell people because of my age, I don't ask people for money. Um, I wasn't taught to ask people for money. Uh, the old folk taught me that if you want something done well, you do it yourself. So when I saw that there was a financial need I said, I'm not asking anybody for money. I'm just going to go out, get a job, and help people, uh, such as my two students. But that's when it really started, when these girls, and females, sleeping under a bridge. I said, absolutely not. That's not going to happen anymore. So we were able you know, to get them a place to stay, and, um, and it, it just went on from there, Karen. Wow. And what about the, the woman that was sleeping in, the student sleeping in a car with, with her child? Well, we were able to uh, make a deposit for the first month uh, that she got herself together. So she did. Um, and I told her, um, and this was before Walmart, I said, now I have other parents coming who are need. I said, you don't have to give the money back to me, but at least give it back to the school. So when another parent comes, we can do that. But she didn't give it back. So <laughs> we have to come up with more funds. Uh, <laughs> For others to come, and there were times uh, I've gone to homes, and um, uh, one situation, uh, one of my students was causing problems. There were two brothers, and I'm I'm old-fashioned principal. I visited homes, and it was around 8:30, 9 o'clock at night. And Karen, uh, when I went to the house, 
I could look through the window because there were no curtains. And what I saw through the windows, I saw uh, mattresses on the bed, no carpet. Um, and that really disturbed me. And mm -hmm. I said, no, uh, I'm just, I got to help. Because these, I take my students as my own biological children. Um, I really love them. I really do. You know, sometimes I have to um, give them a good tongue lashing. And there are times <laughs> I give them hugs. But these are my children, and I'll do what is necessary to help them out. Wow. Wow. Do you think um, COVID, you know, impacted your, because you come from a community where poverty, yes. you know, there's a lot of poverty. Yes. Do you, yes. you think COVID really made that worse? Oh, of course it did, ma'am. I mean, no, no, no question about it, because of course the, uh, my demographics, they have the lower level jobs in terms of cooks and they have to catch the bus. Uh, they are maids and they work at hotels and things of that nature. And if the hotels aren't making money, you know, people are going to get laid off. It very much, um, even to the point that um, the school, as in all the schools, uh, our superintendent, Dr. Postlewaite, she made sure that every child was fed um, at least twice a day in terms of breakfast mm -hmm. and lunch. And they took these food trucks, a young man by the name of Mr. Barori, who was head of it, he made sure that these trucks went to the community that kids could have something to eat. Uh, that's how much we in Charles County love our children because we like to deal with the whole child, mm. uh, not just the educational aspect, but also the, uh, the social aspect. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it teaches them too, you know, to, to, to then go on and serve others, you know, and, to, and, well, and uh, sorry, go on. Yeah, yeah but, and, and um, you know, when I uh, went to college, I didn't have, and uh, this, this minister who did so well for me, because again, you know, my, my mom and everybody, they were gone and um, I didn't have the best of the best. And uh, he like took a liking to me and, you know, he bought me clothes and I drove his car and he fed me and he would never take anything. And all he would say is pass it on. And I'm saying, wow, pass it on. So what he taught me now is what I am doing, passing it on. And I now tell the kids whom I try to help, you got to pass this on because when you get into your careers and you are now self-sufficient, you're able to help others, you need to think about a principal who wants to help you that they may pass it on as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, you're right. It only takes that one person, doesn't it? Just one person to believe in us, you know, and, and it can change everything for us. And we talk about it when we're older. That one person did this for me yes. you know, and it changed everything. Do you think... Yes. Um, do you think that you what you're doing or what you've done, you know, that this what you've sort of instilled in the school? Do you think that the students now really feel seen and feel that they matter a lot more than they did before? Yes, ma'am, because they know that someone care cares for them. Now, some of my students think I'm the meanest guy around, <laughs> but they heard I work for Walmart. They they had to admit that you know Mr. Darby loves us. And um, when I was out for about eight to nine weeks because of my surgery, students are asking, where's Mr. Darby? When is, when is he coming back? We miss him. So that type of connection that, you know, we develop relationships here at North Charleston High School. So no, they, they were and are very appreciative. Uh, even kids who graduated, who are in college, if they need uh, financial assistance, we help them as well. Wow. So it's just not the kids nine to twelve. We have a kid in the college, a freshman, sophomore, a senior. If they need funds, they come to the school and we help them out as well. Wow, that's that's fantastic. When you started working at um, Walmart, did you try to hide it from the kids? Like we? Yes, we, I did. Yeah. I tried to hide it from everybody um, because when I started working, I, you know, I wanted to go through my uh, executive director, Mr. Strauderman, you know, just to get his approval because. Had he really said, well, Darby, I don't think you'll have enough time because, you know, teaching an education here as a principal is my primary position here. And had he said, I don't think you'll have enough time, I perhaps would not have tried to find another means. But I tried to keep it as esoteric as possible. And the very first night, uh, <laughs> one of my students were in the store and I had him a vest. Hey, Mr. Darby, you work for Walmart? I said, oh my gosh. <laughs> That was it. It was on. It was on. <laughs> so yes, ma'am, I, I did try to hide. Yes, I did. 
And once yes, it was out in the open, what was it the talk? Well, of the well, the, the, one, the, the reason it got up because I do have uh, students um, in terms of who have you know various disabilities and whatnot, and they really did not want to work for a, a Walmart because again, they think the Walmart is beneath them. So the job coach, uh, Mr. Rodney Murphy and I were talking and he said, I've got this problem. My kids didn't want to work at Walmart. I said, I'm working at Walmart. And I sent him a picture. And meanwhile, um, I said, I know what to work. They'll believe this. I had um, my position as an associate on my webpage, Mr. Charleston County Council. So the kids could see that Darby see, yeah, he does work for Walmart. <laughs> but then a news reporter saw the bio uh, on county council and wrote about it. And um, that was the genesis in terms of the general public knowing. But I, I did try to keep it secret. I saw that you, <laughs> well, you didn't do a very good job, did you? <laughs> no, First I did all. not. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And then I just saw you on a an Unsung Hero Award, um, I don't know, thing on the internet. I, I don't know what it was. It, did you, oh. oh, you didn't say that. Oh, now I've dobbed you in. <laughs> no, no, I, because uh, I know B, BET had, you know, had done something on well, on these well, but I, I've never seen it um, because I just don't have the time you know, to look at TV other than the news and whatnot. But uh, yes, several folk have come to me and said, well, did you see well, no, I had not seen it. I, I did not see it. So, but no, ma'am, I, I just didn't see it. You better have a look. It's on um, B, yeah, BET.com. B Actually, I'll tell you where I found it on LinkedIn. Uh, Walmart on LinkedIn shared, really? shared that story. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to have to check that out. You better go and have a look. <laughs> yes, ma'am, I will. I will. Because you look fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I, I don't know whether that's an award or whether they just um you know showcase people who are doing wonderful things um, you know well i know um before i left they, they did a little filming of me and whatnot but i didn't go beyond that i you know i didn't go searching to see what was published or anything of that nature so that that yes ma'am that's that's possibly what it is ma'am <laughs> that's very a lot of humility on your part there <laughs> oh well, well thank you thank you very much thank you <laughs> do you do you um hope this inspires oh uh, you know i'm not going to try and make you tell every other principal in in america to go get a job but uh do you, do you think it inspires other principals or other schools to or do you hope it will to look outside the box you know to start thinking about their students and start thinking about you know, we have got some challenges here that we're not able to cope with. What else could we do? You know, maybe they don't have to get a job, but just to think outside the box mm -hmm. a little. Well, well, well Karen, um, to speak with all veracity and, and objectivity, and um, I, I think what, I, what I've done, I think it basically pales in comparison to what some principals are presently doing and what they have done for years. Um, I, I guess I got a lot of publicity because it got published in the news media, but there are principals year after year all around this nation who are making many, many sacrifices uh, beyond uh, the dollar and helping their kids. I mean, you have principals going into war zones in terms of drug infested community trying to save lives. So again, what was done with Walmart is basically pales in comparison to what many principals um, are doing to help their students because this is not a, a vacuum. Um, are there principals who perhaps could do a little more? Yes, but there are a great number um, who are doing marvelous things to help their students, ma'am. And when you say these, um, I'm so glad to hear that. That's that's wonderful. When you when you say these students that are practically going, uh, to principals that are practically going into war zones, you know, to help these kids, are these in low poverty areas, you know, in high poverty areas, I should say? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yes. I mean, if you were to go to Chicago, you were to go to Charlotte, if you were to go to Atlanta, um, I don't, it doesn't matter whether they're black principals or white principals or male principals or female principals, they are principals and administrators and teachers who are really doing great altruistic things for their students and they're not being recognized for it. Um, again, you know, teachers, I mean, that's my first love teaching and the sacrifices that teachers and educators yeah. make, ma'am, I'm just surprised that in a country that 
we don't value our educators as we ought to. Yeah. Um, if anyone should be uh, paid a great, great salaries, uh, it ought to be our educators. And I 100% agree with you. I think that, you know, I, I know I know quite a few teachers from the States and they they all just adore their students. You know, they just go over and above um, to, to, to yes, keep ma'am. their kids, you know, functioning. And, and when they do have kids that are in trouble, I know how much it breaks their heart. So, yes, ma'am. Know, Yes, I, I think that's I think that I just I just love it. What do you think your community has learned from your actions? I'm gonna keep this focused on you because that's you're the one oh, I'm into. Oh gosh. <laughs> oh my <laughs> um um I I live in uh, I was born and reared in the metaphys- metaphysical poverty stricken, abstract poverty stricken community. It's called Liberty Hill. And again, it says I lost my parents quite early, uh, you know, my aunt and uncle and my neighbors and my uh, uh, church members, they actually took care of me. And uh, Karen, if there's anybody, yes, I would like for America to be proud of me. I'd like for the state of South Carolina to be proud of me. I love for the city of North Charles to be proud of me, but there's a community called Liberty Hill. And if I have any desires, ma'am, is that I want the Liberty Hill community to be proud of me because I am one of it. Um, that that community, ma'am, uh, through all that it has gone through from the period since it became um, a, a community in 1871 until now has done so much for me and I could never remunerate those folk who really helped me. So I just hope that my community is proud of what, um, and part of the personal pronoun of what I've tried to accomplish over the years. Yeah. Well, I'm sure they. I'm sure they would be. Is that? Does that let Liberty Hill still exist as a poverty poverty stricken area? Yes. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, the fact of the matter is, so many of well, many during my generation, we had the opportunity to become educated. We had the opportunity to go to college, and so many of us who have been educated, we are not returning. Now, I can't speak you know, to the, to the ladies, because when they get married, you know, they go with their husbands, but there's so many men uh, who were educated and are doing well, very well, and they have not returned to the community. It's a form of um, brain drain, um, if I may say, and um, the gentrification, which is taking part in my community. Uh, there's a statement that uh, Dr. King uh, made that a lot of people don't uh, remember, On one occasion, he said that um, uh, in terms of the African-American community, that it's it's, it's a form of a brain drain that we have left the stench of the backwaters and not thinking about our drowning brothers and sisters whom we left behind. So there are more, I I think those of my generation, those uh, many of my community, they're more so concerned about their economic portfolio as opposed to their social portfolio. Mm. And, um, but no ma'am, the community is still poor and I still live there. I could have gone to Atlanta, Charlotte, Boston and whatnot, but I love my community so much that I could never leave. Wow, Do you, does that make you think about one day, you know, um, I don't know, like designing a project or initiating an, a project to just for that community, you know, to to empower the young people there to to build them up, you know, external from the school. Well, the the community now has become so transient, for one thing, and it's also being surrounded by um, upper middle class homes that ultimately is going to be squeezed out because of the tax dollars. And also um, the, the children of my generation, they are not returning. So within a generation or two, um, I, I don't want to sound negative, but I am just of the opinion within a generation or two, within 35 to 70 years, uh, the Liberty Hill that I grew up in would no longer be. It would be transformed um, to the point that it won't be recognized um, in terms of its historic significance and value. And do you think that'll squeeze some people out to become homeless if, if that happens? Well, not to the point of homeless, but a great number of them, uh, they move and sometimes they don't pay taxes. 
a uh, good number of them, they sell their properties and whatnot. Um, I don't foresee that they'd be moved to be homeless, but I think it is something more self-inflicted uh, that is greener on the other side. Um, I've got neighbors, uh, Karen, who are actually now millionaires, and I'm literally speaking millionaires, but we don't see them anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny how money changes people, isn't it? Really, yes. we need to look at money as a, as a good energy to, to increase impact, you know, but yes. uh, we, we often, you know, ha have a negative view of it and stash it and, you know, and then look down on others. And I, I, that's not the way, that's not the no. way the money exchange should work. It, it should be better than that. Wow. No, ma'am, not at all. Because um, I, um, I know that I had equivocated when I started, you know, out as a teacher, even though it's my mother's dream and I ultimately want to become, but in 1979, I was working at a place called DuPont and I was making, at that time, it was a good deal of money. I was making $19,000 a year. And a principal, Mr. Um, Kyla Gilliard from Burke High School asked, uh, found I had a teaching certificate, I, I want to teach at Burke High School. I said, well, no, sir, no, sir, I'm not interested. He came back again, no, sir. And he came back a third time and he threw some history on me. Well, you know what, you know, Dr. King sacrificed for you. Harry Tubman sacrificed for you. I need some teachers, male teachers, and it hit me something. So when my supervisors at uh, DuPont found about that, I was about to leave uh, this one, Mr. Darby, if you stay, we'll make you uh, a, um, a supervisor and we'll increase your salary from 19,000 to 26,000. I said, oh my goodness. I said, I can't because I'm going to become a teacher. And Karen, my first year of teaching uh, was $10,000 a year. Yep. <laughs> so just the idea, there comes a time when, and not to be arrogant, but there comes a time when individuals, you know, have to make sacrifices to help others. I mean, that's what life is all about because I'm quite sure all over this world, I don't think Karen is where she is based upon her own merits. I'm quite sure somebody helped Karen to get where she is today. <laughs> so, I mean, that's just life. Um, did somebody yeah. help you to get where you are today? Yeah, that's true. And that's why we should surround ourselves with good people. You know, people yes. believe in us. And yeah, so you, you were saying before, you know, that you, uh, you, the exchange is that, you know, I'm giving you money, I'm giving you support on the condition that you go and help somebody else, you know, you know, yes. that you do that. Do you, are you starting to see a shift in the students, um, generosity and kindness and thoughtfulness towards others? You, you might well, not. Well, yes, ma'am. Um, and, and I won't take credit for that because that was, that was a, when I first got here, that is something that I would challenge my kids to do to help out the older people because I would challenge them to go into the community to help pick up trash out of people's uh, or yard or to paint a mailbox, or we have football players to try to help the, uh, the you know, feed the needy. But yeah. now, I mean, there's a great sense at North Charleston High School is that it's, um, it's all about helping others. They even have little bulletins and posters on the wall now, uh, you know, quoting, you know, Henry Darby, let us learn to help others. So, <laughs> I, I, and, I, and I feel good about that because when I am long gone, I am just of the opinion that some of my students will be around in these poverty stricken communities helping others because others help them. But um, my expectations are so great for my student body. And um, these kids have really risen to the occasion. Uh, last year, now not this present school year, last year, uh, Karen, uh, we only received uh, $700,000 in student scholarships. Wow. Last year, these kids worked so hard and worked so well, uh, my students won $1,700,000 in scholarships. Wow. So, I, I mean, these kids are positively thinking now, and that's just not an attribute of what Henry Darby did, but when we come from a collective effort from teachers doing what they need to do, administrators and parents doing better. They don't have to worry about a car payment or a light bill and food is on the table. Of course, um, we expect them to do better. But, this, but all of that is just because, like, I'm not going to say all of it, but because right. now it's a collective. But this all started just with, you know, with that one recognition, I can't have students 
you know, being in such a terrible state, I'm going to get a job. And you've you've ignited this massive fire, you know, that's just sort of that's just really being sucked along and everybody's getting on the bandwagon and, and everything's sort of just building and building and building. And the momentum is fantastic. And you talk about leaving a legacy, you know, you look at what you're leaving just because <laughs> you just because you chose to t- take a job, a part time job, you know. I think it's not in the job itself, you know, that's not right. The, it's, it's, it's what that has caused this, this big movement, you know, that it's, it's created. And I think that's, that's brilliant. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. Well, one of my near was, I guess about three weeks ago, he came to me and said, uh, Mr. Darby, there's a copycat. I'm saying, I'm thinking something criminal is going on. He <laughs> said, there's a copycat. I said, what are you talking about? He said, he read where a principal took on a job to help his students. <laughs> so I said, wow. <laughs> I hadn't heard of that before, but one time, so <laughs> that was so beautiful to hear about. So, no matter people are making sacrifices to help students. Yes. Yeah, oh, that's just so, it's so wonderful. It's so good to have all these good news stories. I absolutely love it. I love it. Now, this podcast is uh, Get Off the Bench, of course, to inspire people to take action. And I, I love getting to this question. This is great. So, um, you know, there'll be a lot of people out there witnessing things that hurt their heart. And a lot of people will feel helpless. Like, I don't know what to do about this. What advice would you give them to encourage them to think outside the box and find solutions that not only help the beneficiary, but also help them feel good about themselves? What advice yes, would now, you give them? The, the first thing I would do would to listen to their pain and to empathize with them. And I use the word empathize, which is a very, very strong word. Um, I recall a very, uh, there's a story that there was a young man um, whose girlfriend was in the hospital and uh, she had a pain in her side that she had to go to the hospital. And when her boyfriend walked into the room, he said, honey, there's a pain in our side. So until we have this altruistic perspective of the problems of others without seeking anything in return, we won't be able to see how to help them like we ought to. But when we make their problems a part of our problems and vice versa, we will develop something. There's something about the human spirit that can't be tied down. When it's time for you to act, to produce, and to help, you're going to find a way to do that. So I would just encourage them to really listen to them, feel their pain, and just empathize, and you'll find the means of helping somebody. Oh, that's good advice. Yeah, because you're right. Sometimes we, we seek solutions and we force solutions rather than just being in the moment and just feeling feeling our way through it. And the next thing often will appear in front of us. Just do this. Yes. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Wow, I love it. You know, there's going to be a lot of people who want to follow your journey and, and you know, connect with you. I don't know, you know, on LinkedIn and all that kind of stuff. And you don't have a website, so we can't look up no, Mr. Ma'am. Darby's WalmartAdventure.com. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't. I, I really don't have, you know, the time, you know, for the uh, for the media aspect of it because, and, and not to be, you know, bragging, but yeah, I'm also a member of Charleston County Council where people are in need. Uh, you know, we have to help. When I say we, I'm talking council as a whole. We have to help people with their roofs, their roofs, and uh, and all that, the, the houses and and food and shelter. You know, it's always a need, and uh, some of us are, are placed here to help others and. I do take a panoramic trek um, to the past and I do say, you know, mom, thank you um, for doing what you did. And I didn't, my father did long enough, but I'm quite sure he would have, you know, encouraged me to do the same thing along with my grandmother. And that is to help others because, um, and the final analysis, uh, Karen, there, uh, I, I, I studied um, Dr. King empirically for two long years. I left teaching um, in, in the 80s to go to Atlanta U to study Dr. King. And if there's anything I learned about Dr. King, he said that uh, the Kingian philosophy is 
you cannot help others without helping yourself in the process. Yep. So my trying to help others, Karen, I have really helped Henry Darby because Henry Darby is trying to help someone else. Now that's not a complete Aristotelian syllogism, <laughs> but it is a truth nonetheless. Yep, it, it absolutely is a truth. And when I, I think when you're talking about Dr. King, you're talking about Martin Luther King, aren't you? Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> That's right. Yes, I yes, ma'am. Like, yes, ma'am. I tell yes. you, I, I, I absolutely love Rosa Parks. You know, I, I, I talk about her all the time. And, ah. I, you know, because often, often Martin Luther King, you know, gets, gets a lot of the credit. But yes, you know, yes. People yes. forget. People forget that she was the one, you know, that actually yes. started that movement, and he he yes, got on to 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 keep it going. And the fact that I, I I do a lot of leadership talks and stuff like that, and I I often refer to her because I think that you know it takes courage. It takes twenty seconds of courage just to change the world, you know. And yes, what we can do yes. at time, and she's you know people like yourself have got freedom because of which is oh, yes in the first place by the way right but, um because of people who you know just say oh, i'm i've had enough i'm not going to put right. it anymore and and right. just have the courage not knowing what's going to come back at you because she could have it could have turned very bad for her and she said it anyway you know she she made her stand anyway and i I just and Karen, that's that's a very powerful word, courage. Yeah. Uh, particularly when you know that harm could be done to yes. you. Yes. When you look at the rules of parks of the world, or the, or the Dr. Kings, or Frederick Douglass, or Booker D. Washington, ma'am, it took courage to do those things. I don't know whether you know of a lady by the name of Viola Liazzo. No. Um, and I, I hope that someone would read about her, Viola, and her last name is Liazzo. L-I-U-Z-Z-O. Yep. And here's a lady um, who made an effort from Michigan. She was married. She either had four or five children. And she heard that Dr. King was going to go to Selma to help Selma do some voting. And this lady left her husband and children and went to Selma, Alabama, not knowing the Southern laws in terms of you, you're not able to, you shouldn't ride in a car yep. with a black male and have Northern license plates. And Miss uh, Diazzo, she lost her life, ma'am, wow. trying to help others. And um, when we realize when it takes courage, you know, you know, people say, well, I, I had courage myself when I knew I needed sleep, but I didn't get it. I mean, that is a form of courage, not as they experienced in the 50s and the 60s, because, you know, there's a health thing that comes along yeah. with not sleeping. <laughs> so, but courage is a very powerful word. And I think that the more we develop courage and start worrying about self and worry about others, yes, ma'am, changes will be made. Yep, I agree. I love courage. That's my favorite word. It's, it's such a such a <laughs> big one. Well, and kindness. Uh, maybe they're both together. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. Kind, kind acts of courage or courage, courageous acts of kindness. I'm not sure, but they, they fit lovely together. But this is great. Yes. And you know, I'm going to I'm going to um in the show notes, I'm going to put the the news story, a link to the that ABC news story and a link to that on uh, the um bet.com, bet.com so that people can have a look and you know just sort wow. of get a little feel for your story but i think we've thank you we've we've i think if they haven't got a feel for your story by now you know we, they probably don't need to look it up but oh wow I, I have loved this so so much you're just a a, a beautiful human being and i i feel so honored to have you on the podcast i really do Really well, good. thank you for the opportunity. And I'm, if it's per, I mean, if it's permissible, I would love to use the court with some of my students here. Get off the bench, yeah, yes, as well as sometimes my faculty, if they get a little tired, get off the bench. <laughs> and my assistant principal, get off the bench, or, or Darby, if you get a little weary, get off the bench. So if I may use that court, I'd be very appreciative, ma'am. You absolutely may use the quote, and I tell you what, I will send your school five books to uh, five get off the bench books to throw in the library. I'll answer. Thank you. Questions. 
Yeah, my my absolute pleasure. And I will also offer you a, a Zoom workshop too for nothing. If any of your kids want to jump on to a Zoom with me to get a project yes. off the bench, I, I will do that for you as well. So. Thank you. Oh, that's amazing. I, I will inform my secretary to keep in touch with you because, oh, they would love that, ma'am. They would love uh, that. Well, I'd be absolutely honoured. And just to do my bit for you, you know, and it's uh, the, it's just how we pay it forward, isn't it? And, and Yes, I, yes, I'm yes, good. yes, yes, indeed. Yes, yeah. indeed. Pay it forward, pass it along. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So I will fulfil those promises. Don't worry about that. And uh, Thank you. Oh, this is wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining me. My thank you are going to love this story, I know. And it's um I just and I'd love to stay in touch. So let's do that. And um please do, please yeah, do. I please will. do. So so thank you very much, and we'll chat soon. All right, Karen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>